In this short video, we're going to talk about finding series solutions about singular points of differential equations. So let's just consider this simple second order homogeneous equation x times y double prime plus y equals zero. We can see that x equals zero is a singular point of this differential equation. Now we might be able to find series solutions about singular points. They may have one or more or two infinite series. And we say infinite series because they may not be power series. Their exponents may be fractions or rational numbers uh, instead of integers. And we are going to have to do more work to find those solutions. We're going to distinguish between regular and irregular singular points. Uh, we're going to use a differential equation in standard forms. So we have the coefficient on y prime as a function of x only, p of x, and the function on the coefficient function for y is q of x. And we're going to say a singular point x naught is regular, provided that both functions x minus x naught times p of x and x minus x naught squared times q of x are analytic at x equals x zero. For us, or for the problems that we're going to be dealing with, analytic means that they don't have any vertical asymptotes at x equals x0 after you perform the multiplication by either x minus x naught for p of x or x minus x naught squared for q of x. So if a singular point is not regular, it's going to be irregular. And in our study, we're going to focus almost exclusively on differential equations with polynomial coefficients. So here's a nice example. Let's determine if the singular points of quantity x squared minus 4 times y double prime plus y equals 0 are regular or irregular. So the singular points are x equals 2 and x equals minus 2. We can see that after we put the differential equation in standard form. And so we're going to check each one of these. So this 1 over x plus 2 times x minus 2 is q of x. So for the singular point x equals 2, I'll have to multiply that by x minus 2 quantity squared. And after I simplify, I get x minus 2 over x plus 2. And I can see that at x equals 2, that new function is analytic at x equals 2. It has no vertical asymptote at x equals 2. And let's do the same check for x equals minus 2. So now I'll multiply my q of x by x plus 2 quantity squared. And then I will simplify that. And I can see that x equals negative 2 does not represent a vertical asymptote of the new function. So it is also analytic. So both x equals 2 and x equals negative 2 are regular singular points. Let's look at a different example. Here we have x squared y double prime plus 2y prime plus xy equals 0. So we'll start by writing it in standard form. Can identify that p of x is 2 over x squared, q of x equals 1 over x. Our singular point, the only singular point, is x equals 0. And so I would want to multiply uh, p of x by x. So it would be x minus 0, but that just results to 
x. So we're going to multiply x times p of x to see if it is analytic at x equals 0. So if I multiply x times 2 over x squared, I get 2 over x. That is an expression that has a vertical asymptote when x equals 0. So it is not analytic when x equals 0. So the only singular point x equals 0 is irregular. So now let's get to series solutions. If I have a regular singular point, so our focus is going to be exclusively on regular singular points. If we have a regular singular point of a linear second order homogeneous differential equation, then there is at least one solution of the form x minus x naught to the power of r times the sum n equals 0 to infinity, c sub n x minus x naught to the power of n. So we are taking our usual power series solution and multiplying it times x minus x naught to the power of r. And r can be any number. So when I multiply it into the series, n plus r may or may not be an integer. So this is now an infinite series, but it may not be a power series. And determining r is an important part of the solution process. And once we find the solution, it will have some uh, non-negative or non-zero um, radius of convergence, but we don't know what that's going to be ahead of time. If that's important, we're going to have to use one of our series tests to determine the radius of convergence. So let's start with a problem that we already know how to solve. This is a Cauchy-Euler equation. But let's try to get a series solution, or at least let's go through the steps. Let's practice going through the steps that we will use to find a series solution. So again, we're going to, our theorem tells us that we will have a solution of the form summation n equals 0 to infinity, c sub n, x to the power of n plus r. So we'll have to take its first derivative and its second derivative, just using the power rule. So one thing to note is that unlike with power series, there are no constant terms uh, in this particular solution. So when I take the derivative, I'm still going to start with n equals 0 for the first derivative and for the second derivative because I have this additional power of r. So then we take our expressions for y, y prime, and y double prime. We don't need to write the equation in standard form. In fact, it's better to, to leave it uh, usually in the form that it's given. And what are we going to do next? Well, we're going to go ahead and factor out the x to the power of r. Notice that we have 3x squared in the first summation, and the power on x is n plus r minus 2. So I'm going to add 2. That will take care of the minus 2. So I'll only have x to the power of n plus r. Something similar happens in the second summation. I have x to the power of 1 outside. I have x to the power of n plus r minus 1. So when I multiply in the x, I'll just have n plus r. So every summation then is going to have x to the power of n plus r. And so that's the same as x to the power of n times x to the power of r. So I have a common factor of x to the power of r. And this will always be the case. So we'll always start by factoring out x to the power of r. Now in this particular case, this is a rare example, where after I do that, every uh, one of the summations starts with x to the power of 0. 
So I have the same index, I have the same power on X. So I don't need to shift any of the indices on the summations. And so now I can just look at uh, the recurrence relation, or actually the write this as a single sum. And I see that there is actually no recurrence relation in this particular differential equation. But that means that this coefficient on my C sub n is going to have to be zero. So this coefficient in terms of n and r. And so I can replace n with zero and I get this quadratic equation and I can solve that for r. So now I have determined the possible values for r. One happens to be an integer, r equals one, and the other one is a fraction, r equals one third. But because there's no recurrence here, whether I uh, substitute r equals one third or r equals one, okay, first of all, c naught is an arbitrary constant, uh, but then all of the other coefficients are going to be zero, uh, which is what we would expect. We know this is a Cauchy-Euler equation, and we know that the solution is going to be uh, a constant times a power of x plus another constant times a different power of x. And so whether r equals one or r equals one third, all of the coefficients are zero. And we get a solution that doesn't have a series formally. Of course, you can always write a series where you have most of the coefficients equal to zero. But we were just practicing in this example, what are the steps that we need to go through to find a series solution? So let's try a different differential equation. And in this case, we will get two infinite series in our solution. So what do we do? We make our substitutions for y, y prime, and y double prime and factor out the x to the power of r. Now you can see that not every, not every series starts with the same power. The first summation here as starts with x to the power of zero. And the second summation starts with x to the power of one. So what I'll do in order to have every summation start with uh, the same power, that would have to be x to the power of one. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and write out the terms that correspond to x to the power of zero from the first summation outside of the summation sign. So when n equals zero, I'd have x to the power of zero, and I'd have a coefficient of r minus one times r and then multiplied times eight from the first term. From the second term, when n equals zero, I'll get 10 r. And then from the uh, third term, I'll just have a minus one times c zero. Now, c zero is not going to be zero, so that means that this equation in R has to equal zero. So let's multiply it out and then we can see that it factors. We could also solve this using the quadratic formula and I get two different values of R. So that would say that I'll get two infinite series, one for each value of R. So Let's go ahead and look at the new series inside the brackets. And the reason why I now can write it as a single summation is because I'm starting with the same power of x in every one of these series, the x to the power of one. So in order to write it with the same index, notice that I rewrote the last series as starting at n equals one, which means that I'd have x to the power of n. 
but then my coefficient will be c sub n minus one. And just to verify that when n equals one, my coefficient will be c naught. Originally I had n equals zero and my coefficient was c naught. So that's good. I did the index shift correctly. And so now that would tell me that everything in the brackets has to be zero. And I'll start by substituting r equals one fourth. And that will give me a recurrence relation between c sub n minus one and c sub n. So let me go ahead and solve for c sub n with this value of r substituted in there. There's some simplification, collecting like terms that I can do. And I come up with this relationship here. And I could leave it like this, but it's nice to have it without any fractions. So I'll just multiply top and bottom by two. And there is my recurrence relation corresponding to r equals one fourth. And working out the same uh, algebra with r equals negative one half, I get a different recurrence relation. So I'm going to get two infinite series, one corresponding to r equals one fourth with this recurrence relation among the coefficients, and a different recurrence relation corresponding to r equals negative one half which means that my solution is going to be a linear combination of two infinite series. In this case, they're not power series. One with r equals one fourth, the other one with r equals negative one half. I'm going to use two different letters in the series summation and my linear combination. I'm using uppercase c's to be clear that in the coefficients I'm using lowercase c. In each series, the constant coefficient, the c naught or the b naught is uh, arbitrary. And uh, we can uh, use the recurrence relationships that we found for r equals one fourth in the first one and r equals negative one half in the second one. So let's talk about the initial equation. Initial rhymes with initial. So you may be tempted to say something else. In fact, I would be tempted to use a different pronunciation, but I looked it up and the official pronunciation is initial. So what is the initial equation? It's the equation that we use to determine the value of values of R. Like in our previous example, we had 8r squared plus 2r minus 1 equals 0. Uh, the values of r that you get are called the initial roots or the initial exponents. And we're going to have three cases, three possibilities that are of interest. The first case we, will, we already saw in the previous example where you have two distinct roots and their difference is not an integer. And in that case, you get two infinite series solutions, one corresponding to each of the initial roots. In the second case, R1 and R2 are still distinct, but R1 minus R2 is an integer. This one is um, a little bit fuzzier. Certainly, you will get one solution which can be written as an uh, infinite series. And then the second solution is going to have a second infinite series. And then it may also have a term where you have a constant times the original series multiplied by the natural log of x. And if that's not complicated enough, the value of c could be 0. So you're going to get a second series, and it may or may not involve the natural log of x times the first series. And then in the third case, where we have only one initial root, but it's a double root, uh, then we're definitely going to have two series. The first series uh, is going to be found uh, as we found our series in the previous example. 
And then the second series is going to involve a second infinite series plus the original infinite series times the natural log of x.